Hey Vermont History students, um, this is the video for Unit 10, um, which I'm making on Monday rather than on Wednesday, because um, I am going away for two days, uh, and uh, when I get back uh, on Wednesday um, at 2 o'clock, I will rush to the computer and uh, see that everyone is okay. In the meantime, um, you know, we're getting close to the end of the semester, actually, the uh, second to last week, so please do um, send me papers and uh, make sure you're all caught up. Uh, this unit, Unit 10, goes from about World War II to the passage of Act 250 in 1969, 70. Um, and that is a uh, watershed in the creation of contemporary Vermont uh, in many, many ways. And so this is really a crucial era. It's the transition to the interstate age, um, which is both practical. The interstate highways have an enormous impact on Vermont, and they're built in the 1950s and 60s. Um, they put Vermont uh, within a day's drive of 70-something million people on the East Coast. So it really opens up Vermont dramatically to the outside world. And it's also metaphorical, the, the interstate era. It's in, Vermont used to be this rural, isolated backwater, and that is not the case anymore. And so the question is, how are Vermonters going to act in order to be able to control the state's future? Um, and when you get to World War II, of course, Vermont has already changed dramatically from what it was. As uh, you saw in Unit 9, as I tried to explain in the video, um, it was, as far as the economy goes, the old economy, extractive industries, textiles, dairy farming. These things were on the, small dairy farms at least, those were on the way out. Um, there's about 24,000 dairy farms in Vermont at the time of World War II. Uh, by the end of this era, 1970, um, you're down to about 7,000. It's the loss of two dairy farms per week over that 30-year period. Really dramatic. So the old economy was dying out. And as you saw, George, as I, as I tried to explain, George Aiken was this agent of change, and he really tried to bring Vermont gracefully into the modern era in a way that uh, not only preserved tra Vermont tradition, but actually broadened it and made it more relevant than ever, including um, by um, embracing not just labor unions, but the people who belong to them, workers, Catholics, and explicitly calling them Vermonters, which was, of course, against tradition, and which split the Republican Party into its old guard wing and the Aiken wing. Um, and so, you know, the old Vermont is already dying out by World War II. Of course, after people's service in World War II, it is really pretty crass not to call, you know, French Canadians from Winooski uh, Vermonters after they've gone off and fought to save democracy. Uh, and um, World War II uh, has, you know, a, the impact of bringing new people to the state, of course. Um, one of the ways that you can understand it is through the story of Susie Wilson, of what's going to happen to Vermont in the interstate age. Susie Wilson was a farm wife, and she was widowed by the time you get to World War II, and she owned a house which was right over near Fort Ethan Allen. And uh, during World War II, Fort Ethan Allen had, was used a great deal, and a lot of people were stationed there. And uh, locals noticed that a lot of the young men in the service at 40th and Allen would go over to Susie Wilson's house. And she said she was just doing something nice and serving them dinner, but the rumor was that she was a prostitute. And not only in, in Essex, and not only at 40th and Allen, not only was she a prostitute, but other young women uh, from local farming communities, including Essex at the time, which was a small town, and Fairfax and Westford, they would go on weekend nights to Susie Wilson's house where they could make a little extra money off of the servicemen. And so that's all well and good, and there is there were, of course, people at the time who knew the truth of whether or not Susie Wilson was running a house of prostitution uh, there during World War II. Um, but what happened is um, that Essex is going to change dramatically, and um, it is sort of a model for understanding how things did change, which is that uh, the reason why Essex changed so dramatically, of course, is that um, international business machines, IBM, decided to locate a plant there, which is connected to the rise of skiing, because uh, Mr. Watson, the president of IBM, started skiing at Stowe, and thought Vermont was so beautiful and had such a high quality of life, he thought he'd be doing a really good thing for his workers if he located a plant in Essex. Uh, skiing really only took off after World War II, um, and it, even then on a small scale, but there were hundreds of small ski resorts 
Uh, Killington comes in in the 1950s. Uh, Stowe, of course, is really the first major Vermont ski resort. And um, this is, of course, something that opens Vermont up to the outside world as well. And um, so then the highways began to get built in the 1950s and 60s. And what you want to think about with Susie Wilson is that she passed on and Essex grew enormously and uh, before you know it, uh, there's the old rumors that still exist about whether Susie Wilson was a prostitute or not. Uh, they tore down her house and cut Susie Wilson Road in Essex, which you may be familiar with. And uh, so now her, they called it Susie Wilson Road because it went through her former farm. Um, but you, as you know, uphillers never tell downhillers their secrets. Susie Wilson was an uphill woman. Um, but the uphillers can't s stay in Essex. It's a company town for IBM. And the uh, downhill Vermont has moved from Burlington outward and engulfed Essex. And there's no one left behind in order to remember the truth about Susie Wilson. Now you can read the article that is online where a UVM student tried to track down the truth and found one old woman who said, no, no, that wasn't the case. Um, there used to be uphillers who knew the truth, but they've all been moved out. And Essex is a fine place. I lived there for nine years. But community is not buildings and ground and trees. Community is shared experiences. And when a community changes and grows as dramatically as Essex did in the period of the 1950s and 60s, then um, the community is going to be radically altered and a lot of those you know shared memories of the past and shared experiences they get lost and this is kind of what you have to be afraid of what people at the time were afraid was going to happen to Vermont on the whole uh, there were people trying to sort of save the old Vermont like um, Electra Havemeyer Webb who founded Shelburne Museum in ni the late 1940s and that was sort of if you've been there she saved old machines and old tools and things like this uh, old steamboats, railroad cars, uh, but in order to like preserve what's best about old Vermont, it's not enough to just put it in a museum and build fences around it and you know make it some sort of novelty. You have to. People wanted to act affirmatively in order to try to modernize Vermont and embrace all the best parts about what modern Vermont could offer, the modern age could offer, without losing what was great about traditional Vermont. Uh, Vermont had its, I mean, built its own problems. It had this um, advertising for tourism um, campaign called the Beckoning Country in the 1960s that it had to discontinue because it, they were people were afraid it was too popular. And development becomes rampant with the building of the highways and particularly around ski resorts. People start building enormous condo complexes which creates strains on EMT services and schools and post office delivery and postal delivery and all these other things. So something had to be done. It's clear by the 1960s that Vermonters want to control their future. And that's where the second part of Unit 10 comes in, which is the governorship of Phil Hoff. And Phil Hoff was elected governor in 1962 as a Democrat. Uh, the first Democrat elected to um, governor as governor of Vermont since before the Civil War in over a hundred years. And uh, there's reasons for that, um, but anyway, he did win. And when he won, first thing he did was he realized the state was being run as if it was still the 19th century. Uh, there's a, a story that Phil Hoff told me, because um, I knew him a bit, and he said that when he first took over as governor, he went to the budget office and the director of the state budget and said, can I have the projection for revenues and expenses over the next 10 years? And the guy said, Governor, we don't have that. So he said, how about the next five years? The guy said, Governor, we don't have that. So can you give me the expected revenues and expenditures for state tax money over the next year? And the guy said, Governor, we don't have that. So the first thing Hoff had to do was hurry up and wait and just gather information. And um, his, then he wanted to decisively act. Uh, his ability to act was very much improved uh, by the reapportionment of the um, the state house in ni 1965, and um, the reapportionment of the legislature is a huge landmark turning point in Vermont history. The one town, one vote apportionment had been in place since the Constitution was written, and it had enormously favored small towns. A town like Stannard, or Fairfield, or whatever, Belvedere, had the same representation, one, as Burlington, which of course Hoff thought was horrifying. He was a Burlington lawyer. 
Um, but it did, you know, give small towns this enormous voice in the legislature. And when the state house was reapportioned by orders of, of the federal court, in 1965, the legislature was cut down to 150 people and it was apportioned by population. And so it becomes a much more downhill, much more urban oriented body, uh, which was willing to act in order to try to regulate growth and manage change in Vermont. So online there's a folder called Documents of the Hoff Era, and it's what the Hoff Era was about, which is managing rural growth coming up with um, plans for how to negotiate change brought by the interstates and by the modern age in a way that Vermont could best um, be preserved. And so Hoff was governor for three terms uh, from 62 to 68 and that was a period of enormous evolution and change and modernization in the state but modernization in a way that was oriented towards not wholly casting off the past but rather embracing the past and trying to preserve it, using state government in order to try to um, be in control of change. And that's what Hoff was all about, and that's what his successor, Dean Davis, was about. Davis was a Republican. Um, he was a Montpelier lawyer, um, but he was also an environmentalist. And this is the thing. I mean, Vermont's a gorgeous place, and how can we preserve it? And there had been a sense building for the previous decade that Vermont needed to do something dramatic to manage growth. And the solution was Act 250. Now, you should read in the um, textbook about Act 250, and there's some, all, all the articles basically, in one way or another, mention Act 250 that I've put online, because it's such a landmark um, bill. It has 10 criteria through which any development is. Um, is reviewed. Um, it has environmental boards set up across the state in order to enforce Act 250. And believe it, Act 250 is complicated. A lot of people really hate it because it controls their ability to control their own land. Uh, even people who love it have problems with it and are constantly tinkering with it. But the basic principle of Act 250, which is that everyone has an obligation to sacrifice some of their ability to um, do what they want, to restrain behavior for the good of preserving Vermont on a human scale, on a small scale, and keeping Vermont as a beautiful small rural state is a goal that we all want. Uh, and so I want you to think about that and think about the discussion question that I put up and generally think about is this the ultimate culmination of Vermont's original ideal of balance, freedom and unity, preservation and development, uh, progress and um, tradition? Uh, or has Vermont, by needing to manage growth so much in order to appear to be natural, completely given up on any desire, uh, any ability to ever be able to approximate that goal and uh, pursue that goal? It's a good question. All right, cool.